Hi, Michael. You are the co-founder and chief product officer at SciFox. Thank you so much for joining us on Modern Health Span today. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thank you. So can you introduce yourself, uh, a little bit of your background, and then talk about SciFox and what they are aiming to do? Sure. So my background is originally in biology and chemistry. Uh, the last I've done some started some startups the last six years now I've been working actually in the silicon photonic space so it's it's a uh, miniaturizing optics on a chip um, and what Cyfox is working on is we're cutting the cost of home health testing so blood testing and other uh, like home testing by a factor of 10 and then hopefully a factor of 100 and we're also cutting this the basically making it much more convenient so cutting the speed by a factor of 10 or 100 um and generally making it something that can be done frequently and integrated more into like a wellness routine versus something that happens on a yearly basis right yeah that sounds really interesting and so how are you planning to do that yeah i mean i believe you have a device that you will ship so can you talk about how how the device works uh you know yeah. my background is in chemistry and biology and more recently in photonic chips my co-founder who's also the ceo he comes from the uh, telecom industry and then LIDAR. So basically, the uh, over the last 20, 30 years, what's happened is large optical systems, which normally consist of like discrete components. So you have some like lenses, lasers that are this large and so on, and they're combined into a product. Uh, and so, for example, like we're having this conversation that that actually requires light to pass through fibers. And so the data has to be converted from electricity to light and then back to electricity for us to be having this conversation. Um, all of that used to be done with these large optical systems. Now it's all done with silicon chips. So it's become, you know, factor of a thousand, smaller, lower cost, faster, everything. So that, that's happened over the last 20 years. Um, and that same technology is now very mature. It's called silicon photonics. It's a mature platform for making optical systems smaller. And it's, it's kind of creeping into other industries. So, for example, miniaturizing big LiDAR systems for self-driving cars. That's what my co-founder, Diedrich, was doing before SciFox. Um, and in our application, we actually went and looked at what else can be miniaturized with this technology. And blood testing tools are mostly optics. So if you go into a central lab and you open up a blood testing tool, it's very heavily based on optics, all the sensing principles used in these tools generally, especially for more complex analytes or optical. If you look at a home device, what you normally have is two types of devices. So you have a paper strip test, like a COVID test, uh, you know, antigen test, or you have something that'll be like a glucometer. So there's an electrochemical readout uh, with some electrodes that'll have like an enzyme that uh, consumes glucose, for example. There are no optical tests for the home because usually these are big expensive systems they require complex alignments and so on so compressing all of that onto a chip makes it possible to just instead of coming up with some new way of doing blood testing just take what's being done in the central lab and miniaturize it uh into a, like a home form factor so that's really the thrust of what we're doing we're focused on so there are three types of blood tests there are uh you know broadly right so there are cell counts um, ions, you know, like magnesium chloride, and then immunoassays, so proteins and hormones. So we we really focus on immunoassays, so proteins and hormones. And uh, you know, examples would be like testosterone, HSCRP. Uh, you, you know, basically, we think you know a lot of the a lot of what's interesting, especially to monitor on a like uh, more frequent basis, like on a monthly or weekly basis. And how do you actually measure the levels? If you can talk mm -hmm. about that. So the, it's everybody does it essentially the same way. Uh, so the the approach is is called immu uh, immunoassay. So this is a uh, I mean I can really go into it. So basically the immunoassay was invented by a woman working in I think Columbia University in the seventies. So basically it's uh it used to it used to actually use radiation. So they would they would add a radioactive tag to an antibody. That's they would raise an antibody. Let's say in a rabbit uh, or it's, it's and they would raise antibodies in a rabbit against insulin. So they injected with human insulin and then purify antibodies out of it. And so they would get antibodies for insulin from a rabbit and then use that to detect. I mean, it's a long story how this works, but essentially it's a chemistry experiment where in the end the, you look at a well and depending on how much radiation is coming out of that well, that's how much insulin was there to begin with. So there's a correlation between the amount of insulin and the amount of radiation. 
in the years since then, the radioact radioactive tags have been replaced with fluorescence, uh, which is what's used typically. Like when you send your blood into the central lab, they'll use these fluorescent chemical tags, uh, which require some optics to read it out. Uh, and what we do is not exactly for fluorescence. It's a variant of that, but we basically took one of these instruments that analyzes these protein assays where you have a antibody recognizing the target protein uh, and we, we miniaturize that. Uh, but the, the principle is the same across all. I mean, any blood test you take where they're measuring a protein or hormone, it's going to be based on an antibody, which was raised like in a rabbit or a mouse or a goat or whatever that recognizes that protein. That That's the fundamental way that, that these assays work. And then you detect uh, using light that these that the, the, the that it's bound to one of these proton yeah. uh, proteins i don't know what level of of like yeah. detail you want the ba yeah. basically yeah. uh okay if you look at for example a paper strip test like a COVID test which everyone's taken at this point yeah. the darkness yeah. of the line if you look at the test if you have a lot of COVID protein you're going to yeah. get a very dark test line so that actually is like gold particles with the antibody against COVID binding to that so it's kind of sandwiching onto the COVID protein uh and so something similar happens in our device but on a very small scale and it's measured very very precisely so how much of that like how dark the test line is basically we measure that very very precisely um cool. but the that instead of a test line on a paper strip we have a silicon structure that guides light that's normally used actually in telecom to do like filtering data signals, but we actually attach antibodies to it and use it as a sensor. Cool. That's that's, that's yeah. what's happening. <laughs> do, do you have one of these devices you can kind of... Yeah, yeah. This video is brought to you by Bioptimizers. Magnesium is a crucial mineral for hundreds of reactions in the body and impacts everything, including sleep and muscle and bone health. It is difficult to get sufficient magnesium through our food. In our efforts to remain fit and healthy, my wife and I frequently exercise after which it's important to recover well and get restful sleep. To help us with this, we chose Magnesium Breakthrough from Bioptimizer because it blends all seven essential forms of magnesium into one effective supplement while also using all natural ingredients and being gluten, soy, and lactose free. It has improved our recovery and sleep quality since we've been taking it. And we are happy to tell you that Bioptimizers are offering a 10% discount for Magnesium Breakthrough to Modern Health Span audience. Just go to www.magnesiumbreakthrough.com slash modern or click on the link in the description to get a 10% discount with coupon code MODERN10. Thank you for your support. Okay, right here. This is really the meat of it. Right. Um, so this is the chip here that comes from the fab that I was showing you mm -hmm. earlier. That gets packaged into a cartridge. And the blood goes into this cartridge. So you collect it into a little collector and plug it in. Uh, and then that plugs into here and all of the optics are on this board. So the, the really cool thing that we've done is we've uh, basically miniaturized. So this board used to be, I'll search for it quickly. Uh, it's like a huge setup normally that, that was miniaturized. Um, yeah, so this kind of clicks together. There are some photonic chips on this side and some, yeah, so th this is it. So when we started the company, and this is the normal way to do this, this is what was, what the, like the board used to be this. Right. So this is like $60,000 worth of equipment. So all of that is on chips. Uh, and normally this is not, this is similar to the kind of stuff you would find in a central lab instrument that's doing these, these types of measurements. Um, right. And then... What I was saying earlier about printing the protein, so I can show that quickly. So we basically, this is a, you know, there's this tiny, tiny pipette that actually prints micro droplets of proteins on the sensors. It's 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 really crazy stuff. Uh, but basically the, yeah, so the, each of the sensors gets a different, so this is the sensor here, and each mm -hmm. of the sensors gets a different antibody that then can look for a different target. Right. Um, that's how that's how it works. I don't know if I'm answering your question, but th this is like the these are the details. These, yes. OK, so you have like the reader and then you have the cartridge. Yes. Uh, and so will you uh, how many tests would you be able to put on a single cartridge? Is it just one test or a number of tests or all of the tests? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, we can put. This is how the readers look now. So there's they're not we're doing another 
revision that'll make them more um, like the industrial design a little bit sexier mm -hmm. uh, and they'll be a little bit smaller. There's a lot of empty space in there, but uh, the way it works is the reader is multi-use. So you use it more than once, uh, you know, it's, it, it doesn't get uh, used up basically it's reusable. And then uh, the cartridge is one-time use and it can do up to 15 different tests at once. But I think uh, initially w we probably won't release one that does 15 simultaneously, but, but we're always basically adding, it's kind of like a easy to update to add additional things. So we'll probably release one at the beginning that'll do, you know, three or five in one shot, but it's mm -hmm. a very small blood volume. So it's, uh, if you've ever taken a glucometer test, it's that much blood. So if you take an at-home test, like in a kit, like a mail-in mm -hmm. kit, it's mm -hmm. like eight drops of blood. You're, you really have to milk your finger to get it out. This is, you know, a tiny five microliter droplet. And we, we sell both, right? So we also sell the mail-in test now. So we know that, you know, the difference mm -hmm. people love the idea of just taking a very small droplet of blood. Um, and we also, of course, select the biomarkers that are amenable to that. So for example, if you're doing cell counts, it's more important to have a larger blood volume because cells are so big that you might not get a statistically significant quantity of cells if you take a very small drop. But if you're measuring something like insulin or other proteins that are very, you know, they're very small. So even in a small amount of blood, there are actually very many of them. So it depends on what you're measuring in terms of like how much blood volume you need to be accurate. Uh, but we focus on things that, are, that don't require a large blood volume. Um, but yeah, that's, that, that's how it works. Uh, and we'll, we're always working to increase the amount of markers you get out of one cartridge. And then we'll also uh, launch cartridges focused on different use cases. So like hormonal, metabolic, uh, inflammation, that kind of thing. Cool. So what kind of time frame are you thinking of for releasing these? Yeah, so now we're we're soon going to open up a... We have kind of a waiting list going, but we'll open up more of a formal sign-up for joining a what's called an IRB approved study. So people basically have to sign up to be in a study and then we'll have uh, devices in their homes. And we informally, like just as a company internally, we have multiple people using the device at home uh, and, you know, testing it against make, doing a blood collection, sending that in and then doing real time results and comparing all that. So we're already doing that uh, with, you know, small number of people. Uh, using them at home, but we'll open it up to people outside the company probably later in the year, like Q3. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we'll expand that next year. Uh, and our goal is to s apply for, this is not FDA cleared, so it would be used as part of a study. Uh, and, you know, you can't use the results for like medical purposes. Um, but we'll then apply for FDA clearance. Our target is to apply in 2024. Right. Yeah, I was just trying to think... It the because i thought irbs were required for like formal trials and uh it's just the right way to if you have an investigational device it's the mm -hmm. right way to enroll people it's better to enroll people into a study uh mm -hmm. rather than just we could send out the device and just say you know this is for wellness or something like that but it's you know our preference is it's Hmm. it's better to do it as part of a study because then we can make sure people understand that, that the results are not, you know, this is not gold standard yet and, and so on. Right. Um, okay. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, but it does actually allow us to do a large number of people because it's very low risk. So it's kind of a risk-based hmm. thing. There's not really any risk, especially if you're not making medical decisions based on the data. Uh, hmm. So we can actually enroll a fairly large, like thousands and thousands of people. Right. So it produces the data the answers locally, right? And then it, it it shares them through the internet and you read them on your website. Is it is that how it works or how do you see the data? Yeah, so everything is streamed to our server, which, which actually does the analysis. And then the data shows up in the dashboard that we use now for our mail-in test kit. So we already mm -hmm. have this kind of a view where you can see your uh, blood test data against your wearable device data. So like Aura Ring, a glucose monitor, that kind of thing. Um, so we we put all of that into a dashboard so you can track it over time. Okay, excellent. But, but that's almost real time in terms of- Yeah, yeah it shows up as soon as, you, as soon as you take the test. Yeah, so it takes five minutes. Well, okay. Yeah. Uh, any plans? I mean, admittedly that's already 2024, but any plans to go outside of US and Canada 
Is that, is yeah, that a big a, thing? That's a good question. I think, so with our current service, which requires you to mail a blood card in, we're completely stuck in the US and Canada, at least for now, although we're looking into UK and EU. Uh, but with the device, we can actually have people taking the test anywhere. So we are going to open it up worldwide, uh, like for open up the waiting list worldwide and see, I mean, it's, we need to make sure there's enough demand where it makes sense. Like we have to support this, right? So we yeah. have to have support on the, at the right time zone and everything. Uh, but if we see enough demand, like in the EU or, or Australia or somewhere else, we'll, and we can legally do it. So we also have to make sure that we're not running afoul of like any laws, but if we can do it, we will probably.